Number 49, Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Any Street Fighter 2 game could go here. There were an awful lot of them. I just happened to have Turbo as a kid, and I think I'd feel the same way about the first Street Fighter 2 game, or the Championship Edition, or Super Street Fighter 2. They were all pretty much, you, you had one as a kid, someone bought you one of them, and you stuck with that one. This was the first 2D fighting game I owned, and the first one that, well, everybody owned. And I mean everybody. Pokemon was a phenomenon, sure, but Street Fighter 2 was still like Woodstock. I mean, you had to be there. It was everywhere, and everyone was playing it. So, for kids and for younger people out there, tons of places used to have an arcade machine or two. And I don't mean like arcades, I mean pizza places, bowling alleys, whatever. Everyone had an arcade machine, and they all had Street Fighter 2. I feel like I talked down to younger viewers a little too much, and I'm sorry about that, but you just don't really understand how big of a deal Street Fighter 2 was unless you were there. Trust me, this wasn't like just another good game or whatever big game it is everyone's playing on, whatever the Xbox is called now. Um, without understanding how arcade machines used to be literally everywhere and that they were all Street Fighter 2, just trust me on this one. This was a huge thing from a cultural standpoint. Of course, that means that everyone owned a home version as well. Turbo did seem to be the most popular with like my friends for whatever reason. Maybe it was just like it came out at the right time. There was also Super Street Fighter 2 and that added some characters and there's at least one Genesis version as well. I think maybe two. But if you had a Super Nintendo, you had by default a six button controller that could play this game perfectly. Someone checked the timeline, but I like almost wonder if that was a reason the shoulder buttons were even added to the Super Nintendo controller. Anyway, this is the archetype of all fighting games. Everything you do in any fighting game, you do because you did it here first. The home version seemed to miss like nothing from the arcade conversion, and it's one I spent a lot of time with as a kid. And to this day, it might even be the only SNES fighting game I'll bother with for more than a few minutes, although I really haven't retained any skill from when I was younger. This happens, like, every time I turn off my Dreamcast for more than a couple days. Number 48, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. This game's actually a lot like Street Fighter 2, in that it did kick off a gaming revolution. Suddenly, extreme sports games were big, and by extreme sports I mean skateboarding, snowboarding, there's a surfing game, BMX, and weirdly enough, Razor Scooters had a game. Uh, these games had great soundtracks, almost always like punk rock, and goals-based courses. For a few years, they were a dominating force, and they were absolutely awesome. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater let it all off, and it's another game I remember everyone playing everywhere. The PlayStation version had to be the biggest, but the Dreamcast version was just as good, even if the D-pad placement wasn't perfect, and this is a game you absolutely, by the way, want to play on a D-pad. The original game was kind of the experimental one, to help the series find its way. For example, no one really wanted any more downhill levels after this one, but it also had probably the best level designs in the series. Everyone knows the warehouse design to the point that I think most of us could draw it from memory, but this was a set of excellent courses that weren't topped in the sequel that gave us more options. So course design was more important than just having a lot of different things you can do in the game. Uh, this game kicked off a legendary series of games, that would lose steam within a few years, in fact, the whole genre did, but it was definitely not something any of us who were there for it will forget. Number 47, Fire Emblem, Path of Radiance. So I own this game. I recognize that today it's apparently pretty rare and sought after, but back then it was just a somewhat weaker Christmas lineup and it was the one I asked for, having played as Marth and Roy in Super Smash Bros. and wanting to know what this Fire Emblem series was all about. And somehow, this is actually the only game I've ever played in that series. That's especially weird when the one game I've played in this series was so darn good. You can beat this game in so many ways using so many combinations. Kind of like the Pokemon formula and brings you back to that. It's a turn-based, tactical strategy game with medieval and fantasy elements, with the big twist being that if a character dies in a battle once, that's it. You can't use them again in that playthrough. So unlike some other tactical games where you can just keep cranking out units, 
In this one, you've really got to be careful while protecting your characters while still trying to achieve the objectives. Because of that, replay is off the charts. The stories seemed fine, too, I guess, but more than anything else, I enjoyed choosing who I wanted to level up and play as, and then turning even Oscar into an unstoppable force. So, to me, you would think if something was rare and sought after, this would be something you'd want to, I don't know, remake or put on a Switch cart? But it turns out Nintendo hates money. So, if you can find a way to play this, this is an incredible game, and one example of one of these tactics RPGs I think I've played. Number 46, Donkey Kong Country 3. The third Donkey Kong Country game is generally regarded as the weakest of the original trilogy. This is not to say that it isn't a fantastic game, it belongs here. Everyone loved this when it came out, even if Kitty Kong would have been good to replace with, say, I don't know, Donkey Kong? His name is in the title of all three games. The music also takes a slight step back, and the levels finally here got a little too gimmicky, whereas with Donkey Kong Country 2, they kind of moved into a spot where it was still okay, it was manageable, but here, everything's kind of a gimmick. Still, this is the kind of 2D platforming excellence that you just really don't get anymore, and that includes from the sequels to this game. Fortunately, it's available on Switch Online, and while I kind of expect most gamers will head for Donkey Kong Country 2 first, you really, really should not sleep on this one. It's got an interactive overworld, a series of Simon Says puzzles to get to the true ending, and a bit of those trading item quests to complete on the overworld too. I always think of it as a big whore on sword quest, but you know, whatever. The biggest thing to this game today is that it's a little bit of a victim of some revisionist history. People kind of downgrade this one today, but it's a Nintendo published platformer on a Super Nintendo, so trust me, this is worth the ride. When this game came out, no one said things like, it doesn't have the best rare team working on it, or the soundtrack is done by the wrong person. What we all said was, oh sick, another Donkey Kong Country game. And you know, didn't all even mind that this wasn't on the N64, we were just happy we still had things to play on our Super Nintendo. We also did say things like, no one wants to play as Kitty Kong though, so that part of history, if you ever hear that, that is actually accurate. This all said, you can have a ton of fun doing everything this game. In fact, of those three games in the trilogy, this is actually the only game in the series I've done everything in. I've gotten a 100 plus percent, so it lands here in the top 50. Number 45, The Legend of Zelda. The Wind Waker. So I have really high hopes for Breath of the Wild, almost exclusively because it feels so much like The Wind Waker does. It's the standard style of Zelda game from Ocarina of Time onward, with the main gimmick this time being sailing the sea between dungeons. I loved sailing and exploring the Hylian Sea, and I've wondered with a friend if this game could actually be played without the in-game map, strictly by drawing your own map. It sounds really fun to me, and that's how we used to do things in the 8-bit era. This is also probably the first Zelda game I ever completed, although I don't really remember when I did it. I'm using trailers here because my copy of the game is with my sister. I let her borrow it a couple years ago, but she let me borrow Donkey Kong Country Returns a couple years ago, so we're all still good here. Well, there's a lot of heat at the time about the graphical style, it's actually one of the only games I can think of that still looks as good today as it did when it came out, and Link's overly emotive style is a lot of fun to watch happen. This game is gorgeous. Fortunately, it's also mostly a lot of fun. I never cared for like the stealth sections, or any stealth section really. I just miss sailing around in this game. Hyrule and Ocarina of Time might have the better world map, but the exploration in this one is more fun than anything you can do in any other Zelda game. I've really got to get back to this sometime soon. Nintendo. Number 44, Animal Crossing. This game basically took over my life for a period of a couple months in 7th or 8th grade. Basically, it's a life simulation game where you move into a new town inhabited by anthropomorphic animals and have a good time. I never played the Wii sequel, but I do have a town on my 3DS that I return to for a little while every now and then. 
I like that 3DS game, but this will always be the best if for another reason than it is my most nostalgic first. And then it also lets you unlock NES games, which for me is kind of massive plus that the other games just didn't have. I did have the island as well since I had though and I still have the old GBA to GameCube link cable. So I got a little more out of this than your average player. And of course the e-reader, I had like one Animal Crossing e-card, but that still has to put me in some kind of top percentile, right? I probably put a lot more into this game than the average player too back in the day. Now, something happened with my GameCube's internal clock. If you look at my town here, there's weeds everywhere. I talked to a villager and said I'd been gone for 89 months. Well, I haven't. Um, I think something's up with just the, uh, just the GameCube clock. At least I hope so. How many years is 89 months? Maybe it's better that I don't go back to this too often. It's too addicting and I know my personality too well. But at least if I had nothing else to do, I could go see KK Slider play some Saturday night. I bet I'd do it today, but it's Monday. Number 43, Ken Griffey Jr. presents Major League Baseball. This is an arcade baseball classic that more or less uses Peace Frog by the Doors as its soundtrack. So this is the best 16-bit baseball game and it represents a massive leap forward from anything you're able to do on NES with the 8-bit hardware. For the most part though, this is less because of innovations in the game. There's not like a lot of new stuff, it's just all perfected all the things that baseball titles did before, you know, camera angles down to controlling your pitches after you let go, it's all still here. It just now works perfectly. It's still not a perfect simulation of the sport, but that's okay because it's a fun version. It's adapted to what makes a video game good as opposed to a simulation of the sport. It's still fun even when you're using my hapless Pittsburgh Pirates. You can edit your rosters as I've done here to essentially have the actual players from the MLB season. And there's all licensed teams, so you'll have the players and the teams if you do that. And then you can play several different lengths of season. There's a home run derby mode. And, you know, there actually is a sequel to this on a Super Nintendo. And back in the day, the, it was kind of an open question as to which one was better. One of them looked far more realistic, um, winning run, that is. But it wasn't really as fun as Ken Griffey Jr. presents Major League Baseball. That didn't always matter back then, but it matters now. This is truly one of the best baseball games of all time. <laughs> 